You are about to hear Dr. T.L. Osborne of Tulsa, Oklahoma, USA. T.L. has already shared the gospel to millions of people in more than 80 nations of the world. He has seen miraculous signs and wonders again and again as he teaches the truth of Jesus Christ. Now in this recording, you will experience the anointing of Dr. Osborne's powerful ministry firsthand as he shares this dynamic message. It's wonderful to know that God is a healer. He wants to heal and that he has us to minister through you, me, other people that we can share this truth with. So today, we're going to uh, try to span chapters 11 to 16 of our textbook, Healing the Sick. We'll skip uh, probably chapter 14 and put that in another lesson later. But I've, I'd like to resume these, uh, these uh, several chapters under the, an outline that uh, we could call the premise of faith, the prayer of faith, and uh, the priority of faith. Let's uh, read Romans chapter 10 and begin with verse 13 for a basis for this lesson today that's going to be pretty heavy. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now let's, uh, let's understand to start with what when we're talking about healing, it's a blessing for whosoever. It's a wonderful fact that God offers His gifts to whoever. And in our ministry or in our outreach to people, let me urge you to always keep in mind everybody People say, Osborne, you preach to the masses. No, I never do that. I preach to individuals. I preach to the whosoevers. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the word saved, of course, is that beautiful word in the Bible that means so much to us. Uh, and it's very important that we tell people what it means. Uh, it isn't a word that just has to do with our spiritual conversion, our spiritual needs, but with our total conversion, our total needs. Whosoever shall call shall be saved. Then he sets up a bunch of questions here. How shall they call? And uh, these questions uh, set us up for the lesson today. How shall they call if they haven't believed, and how shall they believe if they haven't heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher or a teacher or someone to tell them, and how shall they preach or tell except they be sent? Uh, then he wraps it up in verse 17, so then faith comes uh, by hearing uh, these people who come and tell you about it, by hearing the word of God, hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, faith cannot be born in people until they hear the word of God on which faith must rest. So we're talking about the premise of faith. Now, just before we go into this, I want to take you on a, I want to give you some more uh, news from uh, uh, abroad where God has done so many wonderful things. I stopped uh, uh, not the last lesson, but the lesson before that, in the midst of a report from one of our crusades, and I'd like to carry on. It was the day that the Muslim lad, Harold Khan, was healed. Now, I, I share this with you because I want you to know today as we talk about the premise of faith and the prayer of faith and the priority of faith, we want to establish the power of God's Word and what it can accomplish when it passes through our lips into people's lives. Things like this, for example. Perhaps the greatest miracle was the healing of Harold Kahn, reared in a Muslim home. When he was only 12 years old, he was injured while playing football. His right leg was damaged so that all growth stopped abruptly. An incurable bone disease resulted, affecting his left leg, too. Harold was 14 at the time this happened. And since the uh, accident that took place when he was only 12, his body had grown very rapidly, and he was a robust young man, 
And in those two and a half years, uh, his one leg had become five and a half inches shorter than the left one. He walked with the aid of a special shoe for his dwarfed right leg. Uh, it was elevated on a five and a half inch platform, just about the, just about the length of my testament there. And uh, he, he walked with the aid of a special shoe on that leg, on that foot, but his left leg was bound in a steel hip to heel brace because of the bone disease. News reached the Khan home of the campaign. Now listen to what God can do. Uh, and expect these things to happen in your life. That's the good part about God. Uh, Mrs. Khan, Harold's mother, was forbidden to attend the crusade because uh, the father was a staunch Muslim. But while he was away, actually he got drunk. <laughs> uh, she took her son at the risk of family disfavor and attended the meeting. Both she and her son believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The very night they came and heard the message on the power of the gospel. Before we prayed for the sick, Harold believed that God was, he, was, was seeing him. And, and, and he wept before the Lord as he listened to the message. As we were praying, he took off the elevated shoe from his right leg and the steel hip to heel brace from his left leg and accepted Christ in his heart. Then the awesome miracle came to pass. His short leg became normal as the Lord passed his way. Harold and his mother came weeping to the platform, carrying the steel brace and the elevated shoe. And when Harold mounted the stairs with the big, strange, elevated shoe in his hand, holding the big leg brace above his head, he was weeping. I presumed that he had come to tell us about someone else who had been healed. I looked at him, and his legs were perfectly normal. I could see no reason for him to have need of, such a, of that elevated shoe or that brace. Uh, for his, uh, the other leg. So I asked him, who's been healed? <clears throat> he was sobbing convulsively and finally managed to get the words out, it's me, I've been healed. These are the things that I've taken off of my legs. It was, it was incredible to behold. Pondering that pair of perfectly equal legs, one could not help but wonder at the awesome power of God to do the utterly impossible. He walked back and forth on the platform. Both legs were perfectly equal. It astounded, astounded the whole multitude. Well, I share that with you to let you know God cannot tell whether he's healing a headache or a case like Harold Kahn. When we tune into God's life and the power of his word, our need, our imperfections, our sicknesses will be healed. Our sins will be forgiven. We are hooked up with God and He is perfect. Now believe that for your life and believe it when you teach it to anybody. A lot of people think, uh, is this a tough case or is this an easy case? That's beside the point. The point is, do we get the word into people's lives so they can understand it. Now, I want to share one more testimony here. Let's go over to Benin City, Nigeria. Uh, you know, you've probably heard of Benson Idahosa. The, his great cathedral is there in that city. At that time, he was just a young pastor. It's an enormous crusade in this city. And the, uh, the city of Benin City is steeped in pagan culture and primitive uh, superstition. 50,000 or more are attending the crusade. This is what I wrote down that day. Tonight I preached on Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God to everyone that believeth. I think that's a powerful verse. I was able to really convey the message of the good news and was under an unusual anointing as I told them at the finale of the message. This is what I said. I was inspired. I said, my government in heaven has authorized me now, I never put the gospel like this before, but I was just inspired to say, my government from heaven has authorized me as an ambassador in Christ's name to announce to every sinner who believes 
in what Christ did at the cross, that you will never be condemned by your sins. That you'll never be condemned by your sins. That you're forgiven now. I am authorized, I told them, to pronounce that every captive is free. To announce to all sick people that you are healed and that Satan no longer reigns with authority in your lives if you believe on Jesus Christ. I am sent from God with a special proclamation and I have been ordered to tell all captives of sin, disease, devils, that the term of your captivity is ended and that you may now walk out of bondage as a free person, saved and healed by Jesus Christ, God's Son. Well, that just turned heaven on among that multitude of people. Hundreds did walk out of bondage in all directions. Spontaneous outbursts of praise and excitement could be seen as cripples suddenly began to walk and people began to realize they were healed. Great glory was given to God. The message was clearly grasped and a wave of reverence gripped the people as they repented of their sins and received Jesus Christ. The platform was inundated by people pushing and crying and rejoicing, wanting to tell what God had done for them. There's no way I could record it all. A girl who was, was born with a serious problem, I won't go into it, I wrote some things there that I don't believe would be appropriate to read. Today she came and told us that she's now normal. A boy wept as he confessed that he was a thief. Now he says he won't steal again. Isn't it beautiful what Christ can do for people? A lad testified whose right heel had never touched the ground because his knee was bent. He had to walk on his tiptoe. He was perfectly healed. His leg became straight and his foot was flat on the floor. Then a boy came who had one leg quite a bit shorter than the other. He too was absolutely perfect and walked with a true even stride. It amazed everybody. A woman threw away two canes which she had, with which she had staggered along for 17 years. Also for over seven years she had vomited most of her food because she had terrible stomach ulcers. She was completely healed. A man came carrying two heavy sticks. For years he had only been able to stagger along by bracing himself with these two canes. Now he tossed them aside and walked as well as anyone. An old blind woman was healed. She could see everything and was so happy. A young woman with one blind eye was healed. Three deaf mutes were healed and on and on and on it goes. Now, I read those things to let you know when I stand before a crowd of people and announce to them the gospel, I believe it. The premise of faith. The premise of faith, my friends, is the Word of God. Whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, saved, healed, rescued, delivered, preserved, kept. Powerful word. But how will they call if they haven't heard, if they haven't believed, and how they believe if they haven't heard, and how they hear if we don't tell them? So, my point is, in the ministry of healing, tell people what to believe. A deaf man, a man who was born deaf in one ear, came to me one day, and he, was, he, he acted like he was about half mad. I thought it was a funny way to come for me to pray for him. He was so negative. He said, uh, Osborne, why can't I be cured? Well, I said, you can. Oh, I said, they've all told me that. I said, who? Well, I said, I've been prayed for by everybody. They've all told me the same thing. And then I, I tricked him. I put my hands on my hips and looked at him like I thought, you rascal. I said, uh, you think God would be willing to heal a fellow like you? And he looked back at me and he said, well... I guess that's one of those things you can't tell. I said, is that right? Now I said, I'm going to tell you something. You haven't, you haven't read God's promises and you haven't listened to people who have told them to you because I know the ministers that you've told me have prayed for you. I know what they preach and you didn't listen. You came to them and wanted their prayer, but you didn't want to listen to them. Now people are like that everywhere. We have to be patient. We can't go through life rebuking them, running them down, scolding them. 
But let us do our part and be sure that when people come to us, we give them the premise for faith, the promises of God. The worst thing that happens to sick people is to get courtesy prayers prayed for them too quick. I said, do you think, I said to that guy, do you think God's honest? He said, I sure do. I said, are you honest? He said, yes, sir. I said, do you keep your word? He said, I sure do. Can a man bank on you? Sure. I said, you think God's honest? He said, why, yeah. I said, you think God'd do what he said he'd do? If he'd make a promise, you think he'd keep it? Is he that honest? He said, sure. I said, did God ever promise to heal you? He said, I don't know. I said, if I can tell you that he promised, quote you a promise, you believe he'll do it? He said, yeah, I guess he will. I said, God said in Exodus 15, 26, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Who's thee? He said, I guess that's me. Well, I said in, in, in Psalms 103, the Bible says, Who healeth all thy diseases? Who's thy? He said, I guess that's me. I said in Matthew 8, 17, the Bible says, He took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Who's our? He said, I guess that's me, preacher. I said in 1 Peter 2, 24, he says, uh, he bore our sins and by his stripes, we are healed. You were healed. Who's you? He said, I guess that's me. I see it, preacher. And he started to cry. Now, now there was a sincere man. He wanted to be healed. He believed God could heal him. But he didn't know what God's will was. The premise of faith is God's word. Faith can only be based on what God promises to do. When I gave him the promises of God, then he had faith. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. I touched his ear, prayed a simple prayer, and it was perfectly healed. Now that's the way God works. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, faith is expecting, uh, says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. If we could put that real simple, we could say faith is really expecting God to do what he promised he would do. You know, he never asks us to believe him for something until he promises to do something. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. A millionaire could give you a thousand dollars, but will he do it? It doesn't depend on his ability to. It depends on his willingness to. A lot of people say God is able to heal me. We brag about how big God is. You know, a big God's no better than a little God if the big God's not a good God. What's the use to brag about how big God is and how much God can do if he's, if he's not willing to? Now, the premise of faith is God's will, God's word. Numbers 23, 19, Balaam the prophet said, God is not a man that he should lie, and neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, shall he not do it? Hath he spoken? Shall he not make it good? F.F. F. Bosworth has written one of the great books on healing, Christ the Healer, one of the greatest I know of. And he opens his book with uh, talking about the, the power of seed and uh, planting seed and harvesting seed. You can never have a harvest if you don't plant seed. I grew up on a farm. You can go out on that field and pray all day for God to give you a harvest, but if you don't plant some seed, you're not going to get a harvest. Now, how does that apply to healing? The same exactly. Healing is the harvest of the seed of faith, which is God's promise. If we want to re reap the harvest 
of miracles of healing among people to whom we minister or if in our own case or in a particular case we want to reap a miracle, the harvest of a miracle of healing in our body or for someone that we're praying for, we do that by planting the seed of healing, which is God's promise. Plant no seed, reap no harvest. Let me say again what I said before. One of the most unfortunate things that can happen is going out and praying for people and not teaching them, not going out and trying. Uh, the most unfortunate thing is to go out, the most disappointing thing is to go out and try to reap a harvest where you haven't planted some seed. That's the premise of faith. If the sick know the promises of God, and by that, if they know the will of God, then, when they pray for healing, they're expecting a harvest from the seed they've planted. If you know the promise of God, and then you pray, Lord, heal me, if it be your will, that's not planting the seed, that's destroying the seed. The wonderful seed power in God's Word is the great miracle of the ministry of healing. Romans 1.16, as I preached in Benin City, the gospel is the power of God to everyone that believes. Psalms 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. That's a seed. That's seed power. Plant that in people. A lot of people don't know God wants to forgive them. A lot of people don't know God wants to heal them. Tell them. That's planting the seed. Matthew 8, 17 is a seed to plant in people. Himself took our infirmities, bear our sicknesses. Beautiful. Isaiah 53 is a seed that we plant in people. Seed is powerless unless it's planted. Write that down. Seed has no power until it's planted. People come and say, pray for me quick. <laughs> I, I've got to catch the next plane. I haven't got time to stay. Pray quick. You can pray quick. But that's like trying to go out and reap a harvest without planting seed. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 to 22 are very important. Keep them always before, keep these verses always before you. Attend to my words, God said. Incline your, attend, put your mind, put your attention on my words, God says. Incline your ear to my sayings. Your mind, write these down. Your ear, let them not depart from your eyes. Write that down, your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. Write that down, your heart. Understand them, believe them, embrace them. In doing so, they are life to those that find them, the Word of God, and health to all their flesh. Now, if you want people to receive health from God, life from God in their physical bodies and be well, teach them that part of God's Word which promises them health. Quote the Scriptures to them. Help them memorize the Scriptures. Write them on blackboards. Print them on tracks. Memorize them. Recite them. Confess them. Think them. Look at them. Listen to them. Embrace them in your heart. Teach people to do that. Now, if you'll do that patiently, you will have a ministry of healing. Nothing can stop it. A ministry of healing doesn't depend on someone getting a call 
to have a minister of healing. I've heard so many people said, Brother Osborne, you have a minister of healing. Sure, but not because, but because I'm anybody particular or anybody special. I have a minister of healing simply because I'm like a doctor. I'm interested in, in hurting people. I don't like to see people hurt. I don't understand why everybody doesn't, doesn't claim a minister of healing. I noticed almost everybody uh, feels sorry for someone that hurts. Well, I believe we ought to do more than that. We ought to do something about it. What can we do? Tell them the Word of God. Plant the seed of God's miracle promises in them. And when you do that, then you'll have a ministry of healing. Because just as sure as you plant seed, you're going to reap a harvest. Uh, I don't like to uh, suggest a pun <laughs> toward anybody, but I, I'm always amazed when people uh, are surprised uh, that, that God does what He says. I would be surprised if He didn't. He must. I'm not surprised when I plant wheat seed and it grows wheat, or barley seed and it grows barley. Any farmer in the world has got that much faith in the seed that he handles. We are, in essence, seed planters. Anybody can go anywhere that there are sick people. If you can get their attention long enough to plant the seed of God's promises in them, you'll have a healing ministry. Whether you pray for them or not, they'll hatch off and get well. That's as simple as to say whether you pray for that wheat to grow or not, it's going to grow put eggs in a good incubator, whether you pray for them to hatch or not, they'll hatch. Sometimes I think we ought to, we ought to, you know, not brag so much about our prayers and brag more about God's Word. It's the gospel is the power of God that brings salvation, brings healing, brings deliverance, brings miracles, brings everything it promises. It's as simple as that. That's why, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going close to, close to four decades uh, over three decades, Daisy and I have just gone all over the world and preached to these multitudes of people. And I never cease to marvel that, uh, uh, at, at friends and, and, and acquaintances and people who, uh, who wonder at our crusades. They'll talk about our great faith. Uh, they'll talk about the power of the media. Well, that isn't what does it. it the power is there because... The Word of God is proclaimed there. When you preach the Gospel, you proclaim, you project the power of God. Have confidence. You can do it. <clears throat> A woman came to me and she was all shook up. She was trying to believe. She said, Brother Osborne, I'd just give anything to see my mother get healed. I said, she's sick? Oh, she's been sick a long time. She said, I know God can do anything, but you know, how do you, you can't know if it's God's will to do these things. And she was just carrying on. I said, let me ask you a question. You believe it's God's will to save a sinner? Why, sure, she said. I said, a, a bad sinner? Yes. I said, how do you know? Huh? I said, that's great faith. How do you believe that? She'd never thought of that. She said, well, just speaking off the cuff, she said, well, if for nothing else, John 3, 16. She had it all figured out. God so loved the world, he gave his... Gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Said if nothing else but that, whosoever believeth. Now look, that woman was willing to believe. That woman, let me change it. That woman had the tremendous faith that God would heal, would forgive the worst sinner. Just because she could quote one scripture that promised it. Now does that tell you anything? You see, people, sick people, will have faith to be healed if we tell them that God promised to heal them. People don't know that. We have some powerful lessons coming up. They're going to be stacked heavy, dealing with these very issues. 
I simply gave her some reasons. I said, well, sister, you say, whosoever believeth. The same Bible that says, whosoever to, the, to sinners says, any to the sick. Is any sick. Let him call for the elders. Let them pray over him. Anointing with all prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. I said all through the Bible, that's what I love, sister, is the whosoever, the any, the everybody, the all, the you. So then I gave her some more verses. I, I said, uh, here's this, this man, this cripple in the Bible that came to Jesus. He, uh, Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Then he said, rise, take up your bed and walk. And I quoted her several scriptures like that. That gave her faith. She was happy. We prayed for her mother and she was healed. You see, faith is not some weird something that you muster up and, and, and you, you clench your fists and you grit your teeth and you holler, I believe. No. Faith is, is cool. <laughs> it's expecting God to do what he said he would do. What and the way you know what he said he would do is by hearing his word. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. That's a beautiful old hymn, isn't it? Just to take him at his word. Just to know. Just to rest upon his promise. Rest upon his promise. Just to know. Thus saith the Lord. That's the premise of faith. Lillian B. Yeomans, medical doctor, wrote a great book on healing. And in it, she said the biggest hindrance to people getting healed is the absence of the knowledge of God's will. She said people have a feeling that they may have to persuade God to heal them. But that isn't the way it is. When we understand the gospel of healing, then we understand and teach people that God already wanted them to be healed so much that he gave Jesus to bear their sickness and diseases for them. So that's already been done. Now, we're good news reporters. We're seed sowers. We come along and say, Jesus took your place. He bore your sickness. He bore your disease. Since he did it and it was yours and it's already done, you're healed. That's why I said in Benin City, my government from heaven has authorized me to announce to all sick people that Christ has already taken your diseases and you are cured. To announce to all sinners, Jesus already paid for your sins, you're forgiven. God sent me to tell you that and thousands of them believed it. And then we saw the miracles. Wasn't no big deal for me. What I mean, it wasn't that T.L. Osborne was a great preacher. No, that wasn't the point. The point was, the gospel is the power of God. The premise of faith is the promise of God, the contract of God, the will of God. John G. Lake, that great missionary evangelist to South Africa in the late 1800s and early 1900s, he said... The biggest difficulty to help people receive healing is the, the difficulty is the idea they have that healing is separate from salvation. You see, when we proclaim the gospel, the gospel is good news. It's the good news of what Jesus did on the cross for everybody. No exceptions. What did he do? He, for, he took our sins. Why? So we don't have to. We can be saved. Good news to sick people. He took our sicknesses. Why? So we don't have to. Who's that for? Everybody. All the world. Every creature. All nations. We're authorized to preach that. I know we're commanded to the Great Commission, but the good part is we're authorized to. We have the privilege of just taking out and going anywhere, finding a bunch of people that are in sin or that are sick, and go to work on them. Plow up their ground, sow good seed in them, and watch it grow. And they'll hatch off and get well. You do it, you'll see. If you'll be patient, like a farmer, plant that seed, keep giving them those scriptures, keep reasoning with them, keep teaching them, they'll get well. 
That's what John G. Lake said. He said that the Word of God is calculated to reveal God's will. You've heard the story about the woman, that, uh, the, the, the wife of the rich man, that he passed away and she didn't know about his will and, and she was uh, in trouble, run out of money, run out of groceries. And there she was, you know, uh, nothing in the house, going hungry, crying day and night. And the pastor finally, as she, was, uh, as she came to church one day and was praying, the pastor saw her and was troubled about her. And he got down the road side and said, can I help you? He, said, he, knew, he conducted the funeral, knew about the deal. But the poor woman said, uh, I, I, I'm just in trouble. I'm at my wit's end. I'm out of money and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if my husband left me anything. And the pastor simply asked her, said, well, my dear, haven't you read his will? And she just brightened up, wiped her tears. She says, oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> no, that's pretty ridiculous. But that, 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 that's the story that's told about that woman. Well, he went with her to the house. And they, and they went to the bank. Got the will out of the lockbox. Read it. Her husband had left her everything. She didn't need to be alone. She didn't need to be without food. She didn't need, she didn't need to be in trouble. But people don't know the will. Spurgeon tells the story, you know, about the woman uh, over in, uh, in Great Britain. Uh, he uh, called on her. She lived in a little, a little shanty, a little room, all cooked up, and she was dying in there. And so he went to visit the poor old dying woman. He saw a little old frame on her wall leaning there with some handwriting on it. And while he was ministering to her, he kept uh, uh, looking up at that thing and and he asked her, said, what is that? Oh, she said, uh, <coughs> she says, uh, I've had that many years. She, she said when, when uh, she had worked for nobility uh, for some 30 years. And when uh, uh, this, uh, this fellow had passed away, uh, she had continued working for, for the wife. And then the wife had given her this note. And she told Mr. Spurgeon, says, oh, I've had that and I love it so much. It's just nice to know that she gave it to me personally. And Mr. Spurgeon kept looking. He said, would you allow me to take it down from the wall and have it examined? Oh, she says, fine, but just be sure I get it back. Said, I'm so proud of it. He took it and had a specialist examine it. And it was the handwritten bequest of that woman to this poor dying woman, get, leaving her a house and a large sum of money. But the dear lady couldn't read. She had never read it. So there she was dying in a little room alone. You see, there's people all over the world dying. They don't know God has left, that God has left all these blessings for people. Well, that's what the Word of God is. It's the, it's the will and testament of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's another word for uh, that uh, will, testament, Bible, promise, covenant, contract. That all means the same thing. God's will. The premise of faith is the word, the will of God. A lady in New York uh, that I read about some time back that was dying of tuberculosis at her home. But she was laying there reading one day, 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. And she stopped and she wept and she thanked the Lord that when tu tu tuberculosis would finally uh, finish its uh, work in her, she would die and she would go to be with the Lord because he had borne her sins. And then she decided to read on and she read, and by whose stripes you were healed. It shocked her. She called to her mother. She said, Mother, did you know this says I was healed? The mother tried to calm her down. Don't get excited. The daughter, with all the strength she had, said, Mother, haven't you taught me to believe God's word? Says, yes, dear, but t be careful, be careful. Said, Mama, this says I was healed. Get me my clothes. The mother couldn't keep her down. She got out of bed. She dressed herself. And in a few minutes, she was well. Now, that happens all over the world, my friends. And that's the message that we can give to the world. Isn't it terrific? The premise of faith is God's word. The prayer of faith is based on God's word. The prayer, James 5, 15, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord shall raise him up. If any is sick among you, the prayer of faith shall save the sick. 
The prayer of faith is the prayer that's based on what God promises. The prayer of faith is asking God to do what you know he promised to do. It may not be always an instant answer, but faith rests upon what God promised and is not affected by the symptoms of the five natural senses which contradict God's word. You see, our senses, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, seeing, are for this body in this natural world. My senses tell me the difference in a microphone and a rubber ball. I throw one and I talk at the other. But my faith goes beyond what I hear, smell, taste, feel, see, and takes God's word and looks at it only and rests. So prayer of faith is the prayer that believes what God says. If you have faith, Matthew 17, 20, nothing shall be impossible. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will, it shall be done. John 14, 14, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Someone says seeing is believing. No, believing is seeing. Psalms 27, 13, David said, I had faded unless I believed to see. We can sit around and wait for a cold chill or a hot flash and say, oh boy, I got healed because I prayed and I got a whole cold chill. No, because then if you feel bad, you'll believe that. The beauty is to pray your prayer Ha knowing what God promised to do and know that nothing can keep his word from coming to pass. The great story of Abraham is so important in the fourth chapter of Romans, verses 18 to 21. Abraham being not, uh, he, uh, he against hope, believed in hope, that it might, he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. That's what we do with the word of God. So shall my word be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Now that's the prayer of faith, based only on what God says. Romans 4, 3, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Sarah too, Hebrews 11, 11, through faith, she herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age. How? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. 1 John 5, 4 says faith is the victory. Faith in what? Faith in what God says. So I leave that with you today. And tomorrow, or, or next week, I mean, we'll carry on and pick up just a little of this priority of faith and then go into our next lesson, which is going to be very important on the Word of God, plus five foundation stones of healing. It's going to be very interesting and helpful. I hope today you've understood that the premise of faith is God's Word. When you act on God's Word, it will come to pass. The prayer of faith, pray with faith and believe that God will do what He said He would do. Nothing else is faith. You can do that. You can pray with faith. You will know when you pray with faith, when you know what God promised, you ask Him, and he does it. Now, to me, that makes it very simple. And I just pray that this will be a blessing to you today and that you, from this lesson, will say, God, help me to rest on your word and know that heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall never 
pass away. And that's the way it is, my friends. God bless you, and may God impart this fact to you from now on.